This Capital Ministries Bible study from President and Founder Ralph Drawlinger is entitled, The Biblical Basis for America's Commitment to Israel, Part 1. Given what's happening in Israel, I think it is timely to provide this two-part series on Israel from a Bible teacher's perspective. Can you immediately and cogently reason from Scripture why America should be committed to Israel? By way of introduction, I believe that in a reaping and sowing sense, America has wonderfully prospered because our cultural foundation stems from all that Israel has historically provided us relative to pertinent scriptural truth. There is no doubt the biblical truths borrowed from historic Israel have provided the cultural moorings for historic America. One might summarily call this our philosophical union with Israel. If for no other reason, we owe Israel our loyalty relative to our debt of gratitude. But there are many more biblically-based reasons that I will proffer in this Bible study. Our introduction. God's Word contains a clear and absolute timeless promise relative to the Abrahamic covenant of Genesis 12:3, which says, And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. History vividly punctuates this truth. America is among nations that has shown long-standing support for Israel. President Harry Truman acknowledged the sovereign state of Israel within 11 minutes of the signing of the Israeli Declaration of Independence on May 14, 1948. Whether you are blessed for supporting Israel, as has been our nation, or cursed for attempting to demolish her like ancient Babylon, Hitler's Germany, or the present-day Arab nations, one thing is certain. This people and country are extra special, set apart by God from all others. No other countries compare. This is because in the Old Covenant, God chose Israel to be His people as a light unto all the other Gentile nations of the world. Cross-reference Isaiah 60 and 62. They were a people set apart for His own possession, Exodus 19, 5 through 6. Accordingly, the Jewish people hold a very special place in the heart of God. Given ongoing attention to Israel and Gaza, I thought this would be a good time to provide a biblical primer as to why you and our nation should remain staunch allies of Israel. Again, can you immediately and cogently reason from Scripture why this should be? There are at least three pragmatic reasons why our nation should support Israel. Pragmatic reasons for supporting Israel. A. Israel is legitimate. In 1948, when Israel became a nation, 160 other countries acknowledged it as a non-racist democracy. In fact, Arabs hold public office in the Knesset and high positions in its military. It is a nation that believes people are made in the image of God and endowed with inalienable rights. B. Israel is reliable. In an increasingly tumultuous Middle East, we need an ally to protect ourselves. America needs a reliable ally in this area of the world due to the nearly enriched nuclear threat of Iran, which has repeatedly declared its hatred for America. And C. Israel is smart. Much scientific and technological advancement have been achieved by Israel. Financial management and information processing make her a world leader. Now void of earlier socialistic economic tendencies, her free market, roaring entrepreneurial spirit make her a world leader and an awesome trade partner. George Gilder's book entitled The Israel Test documents the historically disproportionate contributions of the Jewish race to the betterment of mankind. This book is a must-read and helps to explain why other nations are so jealous of her. More important than these excellent pragmatic reasons as to why America should support Israel is the biblical one. What follows is the exegetical case. The three major biblical chapters, when studied together, Exclaim why every legislator, government leader, citizen, and human being should befriend Israel. Those three chapters are Genesis 12, Romans 11, and Revelation 7. 
One need have these passages at their fingertips and have intellectual dexterity when it comes to this pertinent issue. Genesis 12. In Genesis 12, 1 through 2, God makes a covenant with Abram, who is the patriarchal father of the nation Israel. But before examining that in some detail, it is important to understand the whole of Genesis. There are two main divisions in the book, each possessing four subpoints. The first portion, 1 through 11, relates to beginnings, the creation, the fall, the flood, and dispersion. The second portion, 12 through 50, pertains to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. In this study, we are picking the book up at the start of the second portion, where God chooses a man from whom he will generate a family, a tribe, and then a whole nation. Again, the nation of Israel, a distinctive nation as described by God himself in Exodus 19, 5 through 6, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 through 8, and Exodus 19, 6, respectively. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all the peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In addition, there are three unilateral promises that God makes with Abram, a land, a seed, and a blessing, as evidenced from this passage, Genesis 12, 1 through 2, which states, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, and from your relatives, and from your father's house, to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing." The aforementioned passages of Scripture are where the case for being pro-Israel begins. Noteworthy here is God's promise in Genesis 12, includes a land which is elsewhere, referred to as the land of Canaan, cross-reference Genesis 17.8. Again, the promise of the land is critical to the study that follows, because in Genesis 12.3, previously cited in the prologue, God states the consequences of not being an ally of his people Israel in their land. Scripture says, And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. At first glance, the passage previously seems quite straightforward except for this. Do the promises God made to Israel evaporate forever due to her later rejection of the Messiah, Jesus Christ? There are many evangelicals today who would answer in the affirmative. They reason that, due to Israel's rejection of Jesus, God has replaced her with the church. This is called replacement theology, and it comes in many versions. R.T., again, replacement theology, reasons that the covenants made to Abraham and ensuing to Old Testament Israel are null and void and spiritually accrue to the church in the new covenant of the New Testament and are now fulfilled more so in a spiritual sense of understanding than a physical one. The problem with this view, as we shall see in the study, and the one that follows next week, is that there are many passages throughout the Bible that indicate God is not forever finished with Israel. Notice for starters the following passages in Genesis that use words in an unlimited sense. Words like descendants, forever, and everlasting in describing the nature of the land promise. Note more carefully Genesis 12, 7 in this regard, which states, The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. There is no qualifier or limitation relative 
to the understanding of God's meaning of descendants in the previous passage. The same holds true in 13 verse 15. Notice the word forever. It says, for all the land which you see, I will give it to you and to your descendants forever. In 17.7, direct your eyes to everlasting covenant. Scripture also says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Israel's right to hold on to the land due to God's everlasting covenant with her is called an everlasting possession. In chapter 17, verse 8, it says, I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Summarily, there is no limitation or qualification to God's unending promises relative to the land God will give his people, Israel. No passage of scripture anywhere in the Bible states something to the effect of, all bets are off forever if my people reject my coming Messiah, because if you do, I will spiritualize these promises there and after and give them to the church. What I'm hinting at is this. The case for supporting Israel today turns on the immutability of the Abrahamic covenant. Said the opposite way, if the Abrahamic promises are now nullified, then one is correct to reason that there is no biblical basis for America to support Israel. If Israel's rejection of Jesus voids the Abrahamic covenant of Genesis 12, then it stands to reason that Israel has no future in God's economy. If God is done with Israel, then why shouldn't others be also? The truth is God has not replaced Israel forever with the church, and he has a huge future plan ahead for the Jews. Even if for now, they are on the side track as God grafts in the Gentiles during the age in which we live. The church age of biblical history. His promises to Israel are not nullified as will be seen in the following redundantly plentiful New Testament passages. Romans 11. This is a tremendously informative passage in light of the subject matter. In the context of Paul's epistle to the Gentile church at Rome, he inserts what is commonly referred to as the parenthetical chapters of 9 through 11 in his long letter. These three chapters reveal God's big plan for Israel, a plan that validates the veracity of the words God chose to use through his mouthpiece, Moses, as he penned the book of Genesis, specifically the words forever and everlasting. All of Romans 9 through 11 needs to be read as a whole to capture the total impact, but having stated that, I have copied some of the pertinent portions to underscore the point of this portion of our Bible study. God has a bright future for Israel. Note Romans 11, 1, 2, and 11. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people, whom he foreknew. I say then, they did not stumble, so as to fall, did they? May it never be. In God's big plan, he has temporarily sidetracked his chosen people. He did this right after they did not recognize, to say it politely, their Messiah. Cross-reference Matthew 27, verse 51. This passage makes it clear that being sidetracked or having badly stumbled is to be distinguished from having been rejected or fallen in the sense of finality. During this period, God is grafting in the Gentiles, cross-reference Ephesians 2, 12 through 13. Notice the same idea as it is expressed in Romans 11, verses 11 through 12. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? God will greatly bless Israel in the future when he fulfills his Abrahamic covenant promises to her. This is the plain meaning of these texts. One must either ignore the plain meaning of what Paul is writing here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Romans 11, 9 through 11, or 
cavalierly change hermeneutical principles from a grammatical, historical, normative, exegetical approach to the text to one of an allegorical, figurative, or symbolic hermeneutical understanding of this text in order to rationalize what is being said by God herein. Paul continues in his reasoning to the Gentiles at Rome, now obviously using metaphoric language, the language now being used, obviously intended to be metaphoric language, makes the point of the study. Paul is calling the Gentiles a wild olive branch that is being grafted in to the root. Scripture says in this regard, but if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree. This is a great word picture. Speaking further about the hardened hearts of Israel, a people having previously rejected Jesus, there remains much hope. Note Romans 11, 23 through 24, which says, And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and were grafted contrary to nature in a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? To paraphrase Dr. Charles Ryrie, a leading professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, a theologian with a consistent hermeneutic, Israel has been sidetracked while God gathers in the Gentiles. In the end times, however, God will bring Israel back on track joining up with the now much larger heavenly bound train. During this period of biblical history, however, the time in which we live, Israel's heart is, for the most part, hardened toward their Messiah. States Paul in Romans 11, 25 through 29 in this regard. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Yes, presently Israel is a gospel rejecter. But for the sake of the fathers, the great Old Testament saints like Abraham, God will honor Israel at a future time when they too will come to Christ en masse. God is immutable in his attributes, one being his veracity. He is incapable of lying and is therefore ever mindful of his irrevocable promises. Immutable means he is incapable of change. At a future time, God will change Israel's hearts toward Jesus This is evident in the clear and powerful passage of Ezekiel 36, verses 24 through 36. Notice that verse 24 has already been fulfilled in this Old Testament prophecy. Scripture states, For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols." Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Stemming from this passage, there should be no doubt. God is not finished with Israel. Prior to examining the fulfillment of these promises in the prophetic book of Revelation, it is important to emphasize that replacement theology cannot overcome the aforementioned theological construct, without changing its hermeneutical approach to these many straightforward passages. Replacement theology is herein discounted by Romans 11 and Ezekiel 36. In these passages, God himself declares he will be faithful to his own unilateral covenant of Genesis 12. Therefore, it stands to reason that his if-then covenant of Genesis 12:3 also remains immutable and intact today. That is to say this, the promise of blessing or else cursing those who bless or else curse Israel applies for individuals, terrorist groups, and nations today. This biblical fact more than insinuates and informs 
It screams loudly as to why American foreign policy should be extremely positive toward Israel. Such policies bless America. Plain stupid is an executive branch or Congress that doesn't get it. Revelation 7. This passage of Scripture reveals that there will be 144,000 Jewish evangelists who will herald the second coming of Messiah throughout the world. I dare say these Jewish evangelists heralding the second coming of Messiah will make us Gentile evangelists of the past look pale in comparison. What a massively huge turnaround will occur in Israel between now and then. At this point in time, the hardened hearts descriptive of Israel in Romans 11 and Ezekiel 36 are obviously absent. Revelation 7 verse 4 states, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Numerous other passages speak of the rebirth of Israel and her inheritance of Jerusalem in conjunction with the second coming of the Messiah. These important passages include Zechariah 12.10, Psalms 132, verses 13 through 14, 2 Chronicles 12, verse 13b, chapter 33, verse 4 and 7b, 1 Chronicles 23, verse 25, 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 36b, and 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 7b. The plain meaning of these texts indicate that Israel will not only re-inherit the land again, a prophetic event that has already been fulfilled, but that her heart will subsequently be changed, and the coming Messiah will bless the whole earth as he reigns in perfect majesty from Jerusalem as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. A flurry of people will put their faith in the Messiah during these end times. Cross-reference Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Revelation 7, 9 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. Salvation is the main theme due to the effectiveness of the 144,000 worldwide Jewish evangelists. Revelation 7, verses 10 through 12 says, And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. What a glorious scene. What follows is the 1,000-year Jewish cultured millennial kingdom where Jesus will reign over all the earth from Jerusalem, wherein in the Abrahamic covenant will be literally and ultimately fulfilled. Our conclusion. Since God is not through with Israel, and since God has a huge future plan for Israel, it stands to reason. Based on the healthy fear all should possess, relative to Genesis 12, verse 3, that all individuals and all nations should be sure to stand on the side of Israel. Amen. Next week, we will continue this fascinating study on Israel and go a step further into an even deeper biblical understanding of this subject. This concludes our Bible study for this week. May God bless you deeply. Thank you for all you do in our great country and on the Hill. This is Frank Sontag.